It's the last chapter. We're going to talk about acids, bases, and salts. And they're all, all three of those are considered together because they, they're holding hands. <laughs> when acids react with bases, they produce salts. Uh, in the chemical definition, is not table salt. All right, so we got a list of topics to cover, quite a few, in fact. Um, what is an acid? Well, one of the earliest definitions of an acid came from a, a Swede by the name of Arrhenius. And Arrhenius said that acids are any compound. When you put it in aqueous solution, it dissociates uh, a hydrogen, at least one hydrogen from the molecule. That means the molecule has to have a hydrogen. Um, and the example there is nitric acid. So when we write acids, and we covered this, I think, earlier in the, when we were naming compounds, acids always have the, what we call the acidic hydrogen first. There might be other hydrogens in the molecule, but the ones that are responsible for acidity are given first, however many there are. Um, and then uh, when we put it in water, that hydrogen transfers to the water molecule. In reality, um, protons, hydrogen ions, uh, do not exist freewheeling in a solution. They're always attached to something. We write them that way because the calculations, the chemistry, the stoichiometry, anything you need to do with it works just as well if you exclude the water. But this is actually what happens. You transfer a proton there, and now you have the nitrate in solution along with the hydronium ion. So that's Arrhenius definition. When this compound goes into solution, and that's a liquid. When it goes into solution, it dissociates a hydrogen. When a base, an Arrhenius base goes into solution, like sodium hydroxide, Um, we can write, it's fair to write it this way. When sodium hydroxide goes into solution, it dissociates into that plus the hydroxyl ion. If the molecule does not have a hydroxyl in its uh, formula, then it's not an Arrhenius base. It has to have the hydroxyl. All right, so that, that was okay for a while, but as usual, somebody discovered a base that didn't have a hydroxyl in it, but it produced the same outcome um, uh, in terms of acids and bases. Now, before we get to that, the, the, the places where Arrhenius definition falls apart, <clears throat> it's important to realize that uh, acids ionize. In other words, they are covalent compounds. And in order to produce this hydrogen, this hydrogen attached to water, they have to be ionized. In other words, you have to form an ion from that hydrogen attached to the nitrate in this case. So a bond has to be broken. A covalent bond has to be broken. All right, and when it does, the, um, the electrons that are in that bond, they go to the nitrate and that leaves the hydrogen ion electron free. That's why sometimes I call it a proton, 
It's because a hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron. Most of them are. So um, a hydrogen ion is also called a proton. So this, they call it a molecular compound, which means it's covalent. The bonding is covalent, so it has to ionize in order to produce the hydrogen ion. Whereas the Arrhenius bases are ionic compounds. In other words, these are associated as this ion and this ion. Okay, so when you've, uh, if you've ever seen uh, pure sodium hydroxide in a bottle, lots of times it'll be little pellets, little half moon shaped things. I think. Uh, I think um, chocolate from melting, right? Sometimes they come in and the, they look like half moon things. That's what these sodium hydroxide pellets look like. <clears throat> and they're solid, they're ionic solids with sodium ion and hydroxyl ions. So all they have to do is dissociate. You still have to break a bond, but it's a different bond. It's an ionic bond. Um, Okay, so as the note says, this is a very subtle distinction, but it's, it's real nonetheless. Okay, so this is an artist's rendition of what happens uh, when an acid goes into solution or a base goes into solution. So an Arrhenius acid in a base, uh, an Arrhenius acid produces a hydrogen ion in aqueous solution and a base produces a hydroxyl from its compound from its formula it has to produce that hydroxide the reason i'm hammering that is because um, that hydroxide still has to be in solution to be a base but if it's not part of the molecule where does it come from that's where we're headed um, and i'm going to give you an example It's probably on a subsequent slide, but, you know, stream of consciousness. If we put ammonia in solution, it will admittedly produce a basic solution. And we're going to use some today in our lab. So if it's going to produce a hydroxyl as a product, where does it come from? It doesn't come from that molecule, right? Any ideas? It's in aqueous solution. <laughs> it comes from water. Ammonia reacts with water. To produce that hydroxyl plus this ammonium ion. That's why the bottles that are labeled uh, for your concentrated ammonia that's described in your methods is written as ammonium hydroxide. I think it's 29% on the bottle. So when it calls for ammonia, look for that. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we need a new definition for acids and bases. And uh, fortunately, uh, two men independently proposed the same solution to the problem. Um, Johannes Nikolaus Bronsted, a Dane, a great Dane. Uh, and Thomas Martin Lowry from England proposed these, this definition for an acid and base and their definition focuses only upon the proton, the hydrogen ion. They said that an acid, when it goes into aqueous solution, is the proton donor. It gives up a proton. Okay, so that definition still works. This donates a proton to that water molecule. So that's an acid. And then for this situation, the proton donor is water. 
So in this reaction, water is the acid, but that's the base, and by their definition, a base is a proton acceptor. Okay? So that means that we can call this an acid, and water is base, because it is the proton acceptor. In this case, that was the base. It's the proton acceptor, and this is the proton donor. That's how Bronsted and Lowry solved the problem. It wasn't until several years later that their definition had to be modified. <laughs> but it only had to be modified because you can talk about acid and base reactions in non aqueous environments. Uh, Bronsted Lowry um, works. Uh, in, in many non-aqueous situations, but there are some where it doesn't. So we need a new definition, and that's, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get that today or not. It's called Lewis definition, Lewis acid, Lewis base. So if we don't get to it, at least you've heard the name. All right. <clears throat> so that's all that problem. Now, the interesting thing about the bronsted lauer definition is this is an acid and this is a base, but these reactions can go both directions. We covered that, didn't we? Can we talk about reverse reactions? Blank stairs. Maybe we didn't. <laughs> reactions can go in reverse. Uh, they go both directions. So that means that from this side going that direction, this would be the proton donor, right? It was an acceptor to get to here. Now it's the proton donor. So in order to distinguish between the two sides, we have to give this one a slightly different name. We call it a conjugate acid. It's the conjugate acid of that base. So bases produce conjugate acids, and you'll never guess what acids produce. <laughs> A conjugate base because nitrate can now accept a proton. Now it depends on the, the molecules as to whether they really want the proton back. Maybe they just want to give it up and get rid of it, never go back. All right, so they're very, they're very weak conjugate bases. They don't want the proton. That means they were strong acids. They wanted to get rid of that proton. It's very easy. Those are strong acids. Right? We'll come to that in more detail in a minute. <clears throat> All right. So identify the conjugate acid-base pair. When we talk about a conjugate acid-base pair, the acid has at least one proton that it can give up, and then it gives up the proton, and whatever's left is the conjugate base. Okay? So. When we talk about conjugate acid-base pairs, there are two conditions that have to be met. One, there's my generic acid. One is it can only give up one proton at a time. If there are more, if there's more than one proton in that molecule that can be released, like sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, have multiple protons then you do them one at a time. So if this is the acid, this is the conjugate base. And notice that this part of the molecule has to be preserved on both sides. So if we throw questions at you and they, and they give you like, um, oh, I don't know, let's take nitric acid. What's the conjugate base of nitric acid. Well, we know it's going to be the nitrate ion, right? But on a test, we might throw something at you like this. And you see that minus sign and say, oh, it lost a proton. It must be the. No, it's not. Because it, it didn't come from that. Okay. Just a word of warning. All right. <clears throat> So in this case, which one would be the conjugate acid-base pair? 
All right. We look on the left hand side and we see um, hydrofluoric acid for the first two. And then we look on the right for A. No. Where's the fluorine? There's no fluorine in the base, right? So it can't be A. So we look at B, right? There it is. There's the fluorine with a negative charge. That's the conjugate base of hydrofluoric acid, right? So you could ignore the rest of them. We found the right answer. Okay. Stop me if you have questions. All right, some compounds can serve as either an acid or a base by the Bronsted-Lowry definition, depending on their environment. The most important of these, uh, amphiprotic or amphoteric, that we use those words interchangeably. Amphi means both. That's the Greek prefix for both. Um, the most important of these is water. Water can serve as an acid or a base, and we've shown examples here, right? Here it's a base and there it's an acid. But the interesting thing about water is <clears throat> you don't have to have something that you would recognize as an acid or a base in order for water to act like it's an acid or a base. You can have pure water. Okay. So let's say we have water reacting with water. <laughs> Looks kind of stupid, doesn't it? It happens. So what is it going to do? Well, one of them's an acid and one of them's a base, right? We can pick which one, right? So if this is the acid, It transfers a proton over here that makes this the base. And now what do we have left? That was lost a proton. So it has this left over. Right. That one's gained a proton. So now it has this, the hydronium ion. So that makes this the conjugate acid. And this is the conjugate base. Now, admittedly, most of them, this reaction at equilibrium, most of them are over here. You only have a very few that are on this side, but it still happens and it's measurable. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, pH. Have you ever heard of pH? Okay. In fact, I'm going to leave it up there just in case. <clears throat> we can also classify acids as monoprotic, diprotic, triprotic, polyprotic. It just refers to how many hydrogens are in the molecule that can potentially be released into solution. Monoprotics, of course, like hydrochloric acid, HCl. It only has one proton. Uh, or nitric, like we used before. Or um, uh, perchloric, which is a very strong acid. Only has one proton. It's monoprotic. Diprotics have two, like sulfuric acid. And remember, they're not acids unless they are, for our purposes, in aqueous solution, right? which means that, as a gas, is hydrogen chloride. And if it's, if it's pure gas, if it's pure, it will be a gas at room temperature and pressure. But if you bubble it through water and it dissolves in the water, then... Now you've got hydrochloric acid. Okay. Um, and these, in this situation, it's not able to express itself as an acid because there's no place for the proton to go. Triprotics. 
Um, best example I can think of is phosphoric acid. Okay. We use that on rusty gates on the farm. It's in kind of a paste. They put it in a gel and you paste it on your rusty gate and it turns all that iron into iron phosphate. And then you can paint over it and it won't flake off. Your paint won't flake off. If you paint a rusty gate <laughs> with fresh paint, sooner or later, it'll just start flaking off. So we use phosphoric acid to uh, prime the gate. Let's see. There we go. Polyprotics are any of these acids that have two or more protons. Right, so triprotic is also polyprotic. I don't know any, any quadriprotic acids. I bet there are some, but they're, they're reserved for graduate students doing research for college professors. <laughs> strong acid. I, I referenced a strong acid before. It might have blown by too fast. A strong acid essentially transfers all of its protons to water. And um, hydrochloric acid right, plus water yields chloride in aqueous solution plus the hydronium. So this one is predominantly, uh, uh, dominantly to the right. There's almost no return at all. Those are strong acids. They want to give up their protons and they don't want them back. These are some more examples. Hydrochloric is a strong acid. Uh, hydrobromic acid, hydriodic acid, right? they're all the halogen acids. HF is funny though. HF is a weak acid. Um, you would think that since it's a halogen, it ought to be strong. But remember, these are covalently bound hydrogens in the molecule. And uh, fluorine is a very small, very electronegative atom. And it hangs onto that hydrogen with tenacity. Then you don't want to give it up. Right? So it's a weak acid. But the rest of them, the ones formed from chlorine, bromine, iodine, those are all strong acids. Nitric acid is strong. Uh, chloric acid and perchloric acid. Notice the only difference there is one oxygen. Those are strong acids. We used to use perchloric acid in the lab to digest plant material. Um, heat it up, it's very aggressive. It will, it will destroy organic matter and leave the ash behind, which is what we're after with the minerals, at least in my line of work. <clears throat> but it was very hazardous. Uh, have I told you this before when we were talking about perchloric acid naming compounds? Good, I get to tell you again. <laughs> Here's what you do. Uh, you take about 50 milliliters, and yeah, just make it 100 milliliters, of concentrated perchloric acid. Put it in a beaker and set it on a hot plate. And be sure it's under a hood. And then you take a nice big double pad of butter and throw it in there. And then you crank your, your hot plate up to maximum, uh, turn on the blower if you want to, lower the sash and evacuate the building because it will blow. <clears throat> so what we what would do was with our organic materials that we want to digest, so we'd set them up on the hot plate and we'd uh, add nitric acid to them, cold nitric acid, concentrated, and leave it overnight to do a pre-digestion. And then in the morning, we'd add our perchloric acid to that, turn on the heat, perfectly safe. Uh, sulfuric acid. Um, you can get sulfuric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid, 98%. And it's, it's used extensively in the uh, paper industry because they, they grind up the wood 
make a pulp out of it. And then they use the uh, sulfuric acid to break down the bonds and release the cellulose so they can make paper out of it. And that's why it stinks so bad <laughs> around uh, paper mills. Because it releases sulfur dioxide gas in the process. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you're driving past a, a paper mill or a, a hair salon because <laughs> they both stink pretty bad. <laughs> when they're doing perms, well, they give off some pretty noxious fumes. Okay, weak acids. Weak acids are ones that, like hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid, that don't like to give up their uh, protons. So if we write it in our, in our shorthand mode, without the water, we just say it's in aqueous solution and it produces those two, then it really wants to be over here. It doesn't want to produce that very much. And you can measure the ratio of this to that in solution. Okay, so this is an artist's idea of, right, if you have uh, your HA acid, uh, it basically produces all hydronium and, and all conjugate base. But a weak acid uh, is mostly HA and it produces a little bit of hydronium and a little bit of conjugate base. Right? That's the whole purpose for that slide is a space filler. Strong bases. Now, what kind of bases are these? Are they Arrhenius bases? Yeah, they all have hydroxyls in the molecules, right? So Arrhenius definition fits for these guys. But Bronsted-Lowry also works because they can accept a proton, right? They just dissociate into solution. The hydroxyl accepts a proton, and there you have it. So both definitions work for those molecules that have hydroxyls. Um, all the group one hydroxides are strong bases. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide, they're all strong bases, which means they dissociate readily into the uh, cation and the hydroxyl in aqueous solution. The group twos, the alkaline earths, uh, the only strong bases in that group, you have to get down to calcium, calcium, strontium, barium to produce a uh, strong acid, strong base there. Uh, excuse me, strong base. Um, beryllium and magnesium are weak. In other words, they're virtually insoluble. Um, And they don't dissociate. Uh, that, that's why I put that note in there. You can't see the thing. That note uh, right here. Even though calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxides are considered strong bases, that's for the, the molecules that actually do make it into solution. Right? Most of them don't. So there's a, there's a difference there between the definition of a strong base versus solubility. They're not very soluble, but whatever goes into solution dissociates completely. Okay, uh, it's a fine distinction, but there it is. Okay, which of the following equations would be a correct representation of a strong acid when placed in water? Here you focus, you notice that all of those are have the same reactants and the same products. Focus on the arrows in between. Okay. Strong acid when placed in water means the forward reaction is the big arrow and the reverse reaction is the little arrow. So I would say B. That's a representation of a strong acid. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's let's clean this out. I'm gonna leave that up there. 
Talk about equilibrium. Did we discuss equilibrium before? No. Okay, good. <clears throat> that means I gotta I'll be thorough. <laughs> chemical equilibrium is a state uh, of a chemical reaction in which you don't see any change in reactants and products. In other words, their concentrations appear to be stationary. When you first put them together, they might be a violent reaction, but eventually they settle down to, to a certain concentration of products and a certain maybe just a little bit left over of reactants. That's an equilibrium state. In fact, on the microscopic level, they're going backwards and forwards at a furious pace. The forward and reverse reactions then are equal. Once they reach equilibrium, um, the right here and the right here, reverse, they're equal. That's a state of equilibrium. And we're going to use that definition to describe an acid. When you put the acid in water, now if it's a strong acid, it's virtually all the way over to that side. Well, that's not, <laughs> if I wrote the right equation up here. But maybe I better do that. Our generic equation. <clears throat> and we got this one plus this one. When that happens, and once it settles down, once the rates now are equal, and that occurs with weak acids. Strong acids are virtually all the way over. So we don't write these types of expressions for strong acids because they would, they would be infinity. Um, but for weak acids, we can write an expression that describes the equilibrium balance. It's called the law of mass action. And it can be written not just for acids, but it can be written for any chemical reaction. So we have this constant value for the acid. And the way you write it is, in terms of concentration, and think molarity for, for our purposes, the molarity of this species times the molarity of this species goes in the numerator. So you would have, and then the hydronium, right, in the numerator, and the denominator is this one. Now, why did I leave water out? Well, by convention, any pure substance, solid or liquid, is not included in the expression because during the reaction, during the equilibrium, their concentrations do not change. Pure liquids stay pure liquids until they're either used up or there's a lot of them. And solids the same way. You cannot express a concentration for a pure liquid or a pure solids. So they don't include them in this reaction uh, expression. Uh, so if you see that, that means leave it out. Or if you see this, leave it out. Okay, so this expression is characteristic for any acid at, in equilibrium from the uh, undissociated acid, I uh, should say unionized acid, and its conjugate base with the hydronium. That's the expression. Sometimes we'll also see it written this way, and that's because if you write the equation like this, in our shorthand note, then the K for that would be written this way. Like that. And that's just as valid. I didn't explain what the square brackets were. Why do I write square brackets and don't put parentheses? The square brackets mean equilibrium. This is the concentration at equilibrium. It may not be the starting concentration, but once it settles down, 
forward and reverse rate rates are established to be equal, then the concentration that you have then is what we write here. And the square brackets also mean molarity. Okay, we write it in molarity, moles per liter. Even for gases, if gases are involved, right? But for our purposes here, they won't be because our acids have to be in solution anyway. Okay. Um, that's, uh, I'm going to leave this one because we're going to use this one most often. This is reality and that's convenience. <clears throat> Another way of expressing the, uh, the ionization of an acid in aqueous solution is through percent ionization. Uh, and all you have to do is at equilibrium, you write the expression and I'm, yeah, I'm just going to use the one that's on the slide. If you write the expression in terms of what's the ratio of the conjugate base to the acid at equilibrium. So A minus the concentration in the numerator and HA in the denominator, that ratio is a fraction then times 100 gives you percent. That's percent dissociation. Um, and it's another way of expressing um, uh, how likely is your acid to produce protons in solution. The thing about percent acid dissociation, though, is that value changes depending on the environment. Okay. So if you start off with a high concentration of HA, the percent dissociation is going to be low. But if you start off with a low concentration of HA, the percent dissociation is going to be high. And it's just it's reverse logic, it seems. But it has to do with the equilibrium that's set up in there. If you have a lot of HA in there, um, uh, it's the, the ratio, right? So if HA increases, then A minus doesn't increase enough. So it's, it's kind of, it's a mathematical trick actually. But we can say this, if we're comparing two different acids, both at the same concentration in solution. Then you can say that if the percent acid dissociation of one is greater than the other, then it's considered to be a stronger acid than the other. Okay. So that's a valid use of that term, of that calculation, when you compare two different acids. And the concentrations have to be the same, right? Because of what I told you earlier, if the concentration varies, then the percent dissociation will also vary. So if their concentrations are equal, then you can compare the percent acid dissociation of the two acids and make a statement about their relative strengths. Okay, we can write a base ionization constant also. So if we have this reaction where we have the base and Yes, that's true. I'm just checking myself. <clears throat> In aqueous solution, it's going to react with water. Right? That's a pure liquid, so it's not going to be part of our expression. And uh, it receives a proton and leaves behind a hydroxyl. And these are in aqueous solution, usually. Sometimes, actually, these will precipitate. But we're going to keep ours in solution for, for now. And the expression, the equilibrium expression in this case, would be equal to this concentration times the hydroxyl concentration divided by the base concentration. Okay. That would be a valid expression for. KB. 
and this will be constant. As long as you don't change the temperature, that value is constant. No matter what your starting point, if you start off with high concentration, low concentration, doesn't matter. This equilibrium expression is valid for any given temperature. Okay, um, I guess I am going to have to erase this because I need the room. I'll just write it again if I need it. Now, we've talked about, up to this point, we've talked about, or I've talked about, <clears throat> uh, acids and bases independent from one another. So we can get an idea of what we mean when we say acid or, or base. But uh, acids and bases can react with one another. Right. Anybody has an upset stomach and chews a couple of tums knows acid base reaction. Right? Acids in your stomach, the base is in your mouth until it gets down into your stomach. Um, and then you have a reaction and it settles things out temporarily. Right? So what happens if you if you have an upset stomach, an acid stomach and you eat too many tums? You have a condition called rebound. After the base that you swallowed wears off, the Tums wears off, the acid effect, the sour stomach is worse than it was before. That's why um, Prilosec and Zantac and those uh, compounds, drugs, are so valuable because they just shut down the hydrogen pump so that your stomach doesn't produce the hydrogen to begin with. But when you try to neutralize them, then your stomach says, wait a minute, I need more acid in that stomach. You know, there's not enough in there, so it, it goes into overdrive. And when the Tums wears off, <laughs> you got more acid than you had before. Okay, <clears throat> so um, when you have an acid-base reaction, um, let's say we have, there's your acid, and uh, there's let's let's talk about this in terms of a radius. So this base has a hydroxyl on it. All right. So what's going to happen? Uh, remember our um, chemical reactions lab. We had um, well, and the lecture. We had something called double replacement or replacement reaction. We have A, B, and C, D, where A and B. Uh, a and C swap places. Right? That's what you have here. This one is going to swap places with that one. So when this one swaps places with that one, now HOH is left over. Water. Right? And now you have this cation and that anion that get together. And very often they're soluble. They don't have to be, but they can be. Okay, that's an acid-base reaction. Acid reacts with the base and produces water and salt. So at least for an Arrhenius type reaction, we have this type of acid and that type of Arrhenius base. This is what you get. An acid reacts with a base to produce water and salt. That's the chemical definition of a salt. It's the product of an acid-base reaction. One of the products. The other one is water. Um, <coughs> Now, in aqueous solution, if this is aqueous, it's going to be actually in solution. Okay, that's the reality. But it's still a salt. Right. Sodium chloride, you know sodium chloride is soluble. Right? You may salt water to gargle with a sore throat. Yeah, so they go in solution. Most of them do. A lot of them don't. And we talked about, in fact, you got that chart with the grade squares in it. It shows you which ones are not soluble. They could very easily have resulted from an acid base reaction. All right. 
So that's how a chemist defines a salt. Now, this is going to be, in most times, this is going to be a metal because it's a cation, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a uh, polyatomic ion. But if it is a polyatomic ion, the only one we've studied so far is this one. Ammonium. Ammonium hydroxide right, would be the, uh, uh, the cation for that base. And the A part, it could be um, a single element ion or it could be a polyatomic ion. Okay, we call this a neutralization reaction. Why? Because you usually start off as, as either an acid or a base solution, and we want to go to neutrality, which is where you don't have an excess of either one. In other words, stoichiometrically, they're equal in molar amounts. That's neutral. And we have examples here. Right. Hydrochloric acid and potassium hydroxide. The salt there is potassium chloride. Right. That's referred to in, in agricultural circles as uh, uh, potash. <clears throat> and the second one, sulfuric acid and potassium hydroxide produces potassium sulfate. Now, this is an overall reaction. Actually, what happens is you get a reaction with one proton from the H2SO4, produces HSO4 minus, and then that reacts with another KOH. So it's actually two steps, but this is an overall reaction. And that's true for any um, polyprotic acid. Actually, we could say polyhydroxic. Polyhydroxyls would be a similar and and um, yeah a similar case, only with bases. So there you have the acid, your base, your salt, and water. Okay, um, and this is an artist's idea of what happens in during a, a reaction where you have a hydronium ion and a hydroxyl ion transferring a proton and what you have left over is two water molecules that's the one i erased <laughs> in reverse okay in a neutralization reaction what products are formed water and a salt now that equation i wrote on the board is also for the uh, amphoteric water molecule it is also known as self-ionization. And other molecules do this also, where they react with one of their neighbors, right? If, if it's a pure, um, it's a compound in, in a pure substance, then they will react with their neighbors. And that's called self-ionization. Uh, for acids, it is. In this case, water produces the hydronium ion and the hydroxyl ion in very small amounts. So there's the reaction uh, as I wrote it earlier. Now we can do, we can write the equilibrium expression for this self ionization of water. <clears throat> when we have a water molecule reacting with a water molecule and producing uh, a hydronium ion plus a hydroxyl, we can write a K for that one and we give it a special subscript. This is the only reaction that, is, that has a W as a subscript, KW. And we would write it as hydronium. 
and the hydroxyl, right? The products always go in the numerator, then the denominator has nothing, right? Because that's a pure liquid. So you only have the numerator. And the value of this is 10 to the minus 14. Yeah, one times 10 to the minus 14. Um, and also, in fact, the most important thing to take away from this is that no matter what you're doing in aqueous solution, this reaction is always taking place. It's always there. Even if you put hydrochloric acid into it or uh, acetic acid, you're making vinegar. Right? This one is always there and it must be considered when you write the chemistry for any reactions in aqueous solution that involve acids and bases. And no matter what else is going on, this equilibrium constant is always the same. Now there's competition, of course, if you have another reaction in there that outcompetes this reaction, then it might be such a minor component that you can ignore it. But you do have to consider it. And um, in general chemistry, we consider it in detail. So you can be thankful for that. <laughs> We're just scratching the surface in this class. <clears throat> now, what do we mean by um, acidic versus basic solutions? The definition of acid and base in, in relative to a solution uh, refers to the balance of these two species, the hydronium ion or the protons against the hydroxyls. What is the, uh, our definition? If they're equal, then that solution is neutral. No, there's nobody wins. It's the same concentration. But if both of these are the same concentration, and multiplied together, they give you that value, then we can easily determine what those values should be. Right? Mathematically speaking, this one should be 10 to the minus seven, and this one should be 10 to the minus seven. Right? That's the only way that you can get that where they're both equal. Right? Right? If the base is the same, then you just add the powers and there you go. So that's 10 to the minus seventh molar is the concentration at which if, if they're both 10 to the minus seventh, you have a neutral solution. Now, if one exceeds the other, say um, this one gets bigger. So if you got a negative exponent, which way is bigger? Like 10 to the minus six, or 10 to the minus five, right? That's bigger. It's less small, okay? That means that if this times that equals that, then you know what this one's gonna be too, right? This one would have to be 10 to the minus eight, and this one would have to be 10 to the minus nine. Molar, to, to multiply together and give you that value, okay? So if, if now we're out of balance and we got more and more hydrogen or hydroniums than we do hydroxyls, that's an acid solution. This is acidic. If we go the other way, say we put these over here and make the hydroxyl more concentrated than the, hyd the hydroniums, that would be basic. Okay. And that's what that, those graphs are trying to show, is it's the balance that matters. Okay, so if the, if the hydrogen ion concentration is greater than the hydroxyls, you've got acidic and vice versa, you have basic. Now, if we change the temperature, and this, uh, this value is correct for 20, 
I think it's 23 degrees C, that exact value. If we change the temperature, then that value changes, right? It has to. But still, the definition of acid, base, and neutral stands. It's the balance. So if this changes, then these concentrations will change, but if it's neutral, they'll still both be equal. Okay, I'm not gonna throw any of those at you. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so um, we can calculate these concentrations if we know one from the other, right? Um, I, I, I misspoke, 24 degrees. 24 degrees is 10 to the minus 14 is the KW for that reaction. Okay, for this solution where we have one times 10 to the minus fourth hydroxyls, 10 to the minus fourth hydroxyls, and that multiplied has to be 10 to the minus 14, what's the hydrogen ion concentration? In the minus 10th, isn't it? Right. So this is very low concentration of hydroniums and a higher concentration of hydroxyls, that's a basic solution. What if we have two molar, let's see, two molar hydroniums? That's acidic. <laughs> this would have to be pretty small in order to equal 10 to the minus 14. Let's see, did we do calculations? Yeah, that's the first one. So the, hydron the hydronium concentration for the A is 10 to the minus 10th. And then if we do the second one, well, we just say 10 to the minus 10th. Well, that makes it basic, yeah, because it's much, much less than 10 to the minus seven. Uh, okay, now we're gonna say two molar is much, much greater than 10 to the minus seventh, which would be neutral. So it's acidic. We didn't even do a calculation for that one. It, Actually, it'd be almost meaningless because the value over here would have to be so small in order to give us that. All right. Now, this is, these are valid calculations, but they're not convenient, right? Because we have to work in scientific notation. And a... Uh, a Dane, a Danish chemist, uh, his last name was Sorensen, uh, was working with, I think he was working with living systems. But what he wanted was a more convenient way to express acidity and basicity. And he came up with this mathematical expression. It's a logarithmic scale. And all it is, is you take the hydronium concentration or the hydrogen ion concentration in solution, take the log of it. So let's say we have a neutral, the hydroniums are 10 to the minus seventh molar. Right? And you, it has to be in molarity. If you take the log of that, and this is the common log, base 10. Right? Uh, everybody remember logarithms from math class? how you do logarithms. If you have the uh, log base A uh, B equals X, what does that mean? That means A to the X power is B. Okay, that's what a logarithm is. So this to what power equals that? Well, 10 to the minus seven power is that, right? But Sorensen didn't want negatives either. So that's why he stuck a negative out here. So the negative log of 10 to the minus seven is seven. 
That's why pH 7 is neutral. And he used small p, big H. If you write it any other way, it's wrong. A big P, big H, or a big P, little h, is not pH in, in this scenario, this uh, calculation. So if that's neutral, we can actually set up a scale. Right? So if the pH is seven, that's neutral. So what would the pH be for acidic solutions? Say we're going acid on this side and base on this side. Well, just make that small, uh, bigger, to be acidic, right? 10 to the minus six. So six would be acidic. And five would be more. Four would be more. Three, two. Those would that'd be very acidic. In fact, that's down around what your stomach is. Between one and a half and two, right in there, is your stomach, normally. Right, if you just eat a... A big plate of spaghetti with tomato sauce on it, um, it's going to go down. And then we go the other direction, right? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's about as high as you go and about as low as you go for this pH scale. I mean, you can, you can calculate pH uh, using any concentration of hydrogen ions. Right. And it may not fall on that scale. You can actually have negative pH. Right. And what if we did, um, let's see, how about that one earlier? Two molar, negative log of two molar equals what? Well, I don't know what the log of two is. I have to calculate it. So let's say two and just take the log. Got to find the log key on your calculator. L O G. Okay. And then Take the negative of it. Minus 0 0.3. That's pH. So you can get negative pHs because this is simply a, a mathematical transformation. It's a formula. Okay, so you can get negatives. They don't have much meaning. Right? Sorensen was only interested in pHs in this range. But the, the transformation is perfectly valid. <clears throat> so what's the pH of uh, uh, when the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus four? It's four. Okay. How about 0 0.04 hydroxyl? You want to know the pH of that? Well, you got to convert it to hydrogen ions first. So we need this formula equal to 10 to the minus 14, put in your hydroxyl ion concentration, and then that comes over here, divided into that one, 10 to the minus 14. That's why 10 to the minus 14 is in the numerator in that expression. And the denominator has this concentration. That's your hydrogen ion concentration. Then you can calculate pH. There you go. So the pH of this solution is 12.6. That means very basic. Okay. Now, uh, let me take a quick look, see if I'm going to give you a shortcut way. No. I don't see it. I should have, though. How are we doing on time? We're running out of time, of course. So I'm going to have to skip that. You know, get the shortcut. I'll tell you how to get to it, though. That expression, take the negative log of the entire equation. Take the negative log of this side, you get minus, yeah, excuse me, you get PKW equals pH times POH. Right. 
equals what? 14. Okay, you have to do that at home. So if you calculate POH with that value right here, uh, here. No, that's not it. Take this one right here. Calculate POH, subtract it from 14, and you'll get 12.6. All right. So I got to get a move on here. Everybody knows we're not going to meet next week, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to be here. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be, I'll be recovering from Turkey on Friday. <clears throat> so the pH of a solution is 5.85. What's the concentration of hydrogen ions? This is simply a mathematical expression. If the pH is 5.85, what does that mean? That means the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. Okay. So if we use what we know about logarithms, remember this is base 10. That means uh, before we do the, the log transformation, we got to move that negative over here. So negative 5.85 equals the log of hydrogen ion concentration. Now we can do the transformation. That is the power of 10 that equals this value. So 10 to the minus 5.85 is equal to the hydrogen ion concentration. So where is that on your calculator? It's usually um, a function key and right above the log key. It'll say maybe 10 to the X on your calculator if you need to do that calculation. There it is in nauseating detail. Okay, so we talked about these already. pH greater than seven is basic, less than seven is acidic, and seven is neutral. These are various examples. Uh, some foods are acidic, like limes. Even apples are acidic, right? especially those that are tart, like Granny Smith's or probably lower pH than others, but you get that sweet and sour together, that's what your tongue likes. Kind of think Chinese. <clears throat> Strawberries, peaches, they're all acidic. But what's causing the acidity? That could be different for each one. Organic acids, most of them. Right? They still have that proton that dissociates from the molecule that ionizes, but it could be a different structure, right? This, one of the simpler ones is vinegar, right? Acetic acid, right? There's your, dis, your ionizable hydrogen. These guys are stuck. They can't move, but that one can. So that's why acetic acid in vinegar uh, is a sour taste because of that one hydrogen. Okay, uh, which following is correct mathematical expression for pH? It's that one right there. Or you can use H plus in there also. It works. In fact, it makes more sense, right? If you say pH, you don't say pH 3O plus, right? <laughs> Say pH. Okay. Um, okay, I did do it. Calculate pKW. Well, the kW is 10 minus 14. So pKW is that same log transformation, negative log of the K. Right, is 
How did I miss that? It's there. That's it. PKW equals pH plus pOH equals 14. So there you have your shortcut method. All right. So what's the pKa for hyd hydrofluoric acid? Well, the Ka is 6.8 times 10 to the minus fourth. Right? So when you see a number that small as a value for K, you know that the numerator is very small. And remember, the numerator is the product side. So there's not much product there. It's mostly reactant. And that's characteristic of weak acids. So the pKa for that value is just the negative log of the value, 3.17. And the smaller the value, the stronger the acid. The larger the value, the weaker the acid. And that goes back to the original value. Okay, so pKa is another method of expressing the strength of an acid. Uh, if the Ka of a solution is 10 to the minus fourth, 6.3 times 10 to the minus fourth, what's the pKa and is the solution acidic or basic? Oh, we just did that one. Right. So you can think of that in terms of is the pKa um, less than seven or greater than seven? If it's less than seven, it's an acid. If it's greater than seven, it's, it's more basic. Okay, uh, when salts go into solution, say you have um, the salt that's isolated from an acid-base reaction. When it goes into solution, what does it do? Breaks apart into the cation and the anion. What can it do then? It could react with water. Right? Because the anion could be considered a conjugate base of an acid. All right? If we have, um, let's say, uh, sodium phosphate, right? That's soluble in water. Remember, all sodium salts are soluble in water. So when we put it in solution, what does it do? Well, it breaks apart into three sodiums and one phosphate. Okay. Now those can react with water. Is sodium going to react with water? No. Think of where it came from. Sodium could have come from sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. It wants to give up its hydroxyls. You don't want them back. So sodium does not react with water. It doesn't try to take hydroxyls back from water. Okay. But the phosphate is um, a strong base. It comes from a weak acid. In fact, when you write expressions for acid dissociation, remember you do it one proton at a time. Oops, it's only one minus two here, All right? Then that can dissociate again, and give off another proton. Now you have PO4 two minus, and then that one can dissociate again to give off its final proton. And that means that one. So that's where this one came from. This is a weak acid to begin with. And with every successive proton, the acid gets weaker. The conjugate base becomes an acid and it's weaker and weaker and weaker. So the rule is weak acids make strong conjugate bases and strong acids make weak conjugate bases. So this one is uh, from uh, a relatively weak acid, but it gets weaker and weaker. 
So that means by the time you get down to here, this is a very, very strong base. It wants a proton. Right? It, it'll die for a proton. So that phosphate now in solution reacts with water. And it takes a proton from water and leaves behind hydroxyl. So when you put this compound in solution, sodium doesn't react with water, phosphate does. And the reaction of phosphate with water gives you hydroxyls, which makes the solution basic. So if the cation comes from a strong base and the anion comes from a very weak acid, then you're gonna have a basic solution. That's known as hydrolysis where the salt reacts with water. Now it can go the other way around, depending on what this one is, it could react with water and this one not react with water. In that case, this one reacting with water would take the hydroxide and leave behind the protons. That would give you an acidic solution, okay? So <clears throat> rules of thumb. That's the truth, that's the reality. That's what happens when you dissolve a salt in water. Rule of thumb is if the, both the acid, both the cation and the anion are derived from strong acid and base respectively, then you get a neutral solution because neither one of them want to react with water and water by definition is neutral. Pure water is neutral. So if they don't react with water, you get a neutral solution. Sodium chloride is a good example of that. Okay, makes a neutral solution. Come on, there we go. If, on the other hand, you have a salt that's made from a weak base, like ammonia, NH3, and a strong acid like HCl, hydrochloric acid, then the solution is going to be acidic. So the rule of thumb is um, if the salt is made from, if the cation is from a weak acid, so weak, strong. Let's see, did I do that right? No, I did it backwards. No, no, that's right. If this side of the molecule, for example, that, and that. So this is derived from a weak base. This is derived from a strong acid. Dissolve them in water, you get a strong an acidic solution. And then if you flip it, where this side is weak and that side strong, you get this situation. Weak, strong. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So this one would give you a basic solution. And that's the other rule of thumb. Okay. Now, the fly in the ointment is, what if you've got a, if they're derived from a weak base and a weak acid? What do you do then? The rule of thumb don't work <laughs> in that case. You have to know, you have to have more information. How strong is strong and how weak is weak and do a comparison. And for this course, uh, we don't have that option. It's too short. But my general chemistry students are tortured with that proposition. In other words, um, you, you can't tell without more information if both of them are derived from weak acids and bases. like uh, ammonium acetate, like ammonia is a weak base, uh, acetic acid is a weak acid. You put them together, that's a bad example because they're, they're both about equal in strength. So when you put those together, you get a neutral solution, but it's not always the case. Okay, I'm gonna have to skip that.
So what's a buffer? I got a half hour. Do I have an idea of what a buffer is? In terms of acids and bases, a buffer. Now I'm not talking about the hunt for red October, right? Where the uh, KGB agent ripped out a buffer circuit and they uh, shut down their silent drive. <laughs> no, it's not that buffer. <clears throat> this is a chemical buffer. What we say when we just, when we say as chemists, we say buffer, we mean that the solution that's created has a very stable pH. In other words, you can add extra acid to it or add extra base to it, and the pH won't move very much. It will move, but not a lot. If you add that same acid, say, to pure water, then the pH will go, <laughs> hit the floor. Or if you add sodium hydroxide to it, pH will go <laughs> to the ceiling. But if you do the same amounts of either one to a buffer, it just, <laughs> just a little bit of movement, not much. It resists, buffers resist a change in pH. Um, so the, the way a buffer works is it has two active species in solution and they have to be the right concentration within a range in order to, uh, resist that change in pH. If you add acid to it, you need something in that solution that will snap up those hydrogen ions so that they don't change the pH too much acidic, okay? If you add hydroxyls in there, you need something also that will snap up those hydro hydroxyls and won't let them change the pH much easier. All right, so you need, you need a, a special arrangement of cations and anions in that solution that will do both of those tasks depending on what's presented add acid or as base. <clears throat> um, let me see if this makes sense. If you add hydroxyl ions, the added hydroxyls, if you add base, react with the hydronium ion to produce water. So that's a neutralization reaction. Okay, so that's, that soaks up the hydroxyls and the pH doesn't change much. Um, typically, a buffer is made up of a weak acid, okay, a weak acid and its conjugate base. Not all buffers, but for our discussion, since we're limited on time and scope, um, we'll focus on this one. Most of them are weak acids and the conjugate base. So that makes this one a strong conjugate base. All right, how did they get there? Well, this weak acid would react with water and produce that conjugate base plus the hydronium ion. Okay. Now, what happens if you add, in this case, we're, we're talking about hydroxyls. So if you add hydroxyls, remember, this reaction is occurring in, in solution, and they're all there together. It's not like this is on one side by itself, and this is on another side in another vessel. They're all together. So when you add a hydroxyl, it's going to go to uh, where it can get a, a hydrogen ion. And it takes it from this one. Right. Think about it this way. When water dissociates like that, that's the simplified version. Which way is it preferred? 
It wants to be over here because it's a weak, a weak acid, right? It only produces a very little bit of that, right? 10 to the minus 14. And each one of them is 10 to the minus seven, right? So most of it's over here. That means anytime we throw hydroxyl in that solution, that hydrogen ion is going to snap it up and go that direction because that's where it wants to be. So in this case, that wants to give up its proton and go back to the water. It wants to be water, right? So if we add hydroxyls in here, they go back over here. That consumes the hydroxyls and limits the change in pH toward the basic. Okay. All right. What if we add hydrogen ion? If you add hydrogen ions, right, acid, where are they going to react? Well, they're not going to react with this. Right, it's already got a proton. It has to react with that one. And it's not going to react with this one. Because that is a very strong, uh, yeah, that's a weak acid. In fact, it's a weak acid and a weak base. This is the strongest in the solution. This one right here, because it came from a weak acid. Now it's a strong base. It wants protons desperately. If you throw some in there, it's going to take them immediately and go back that way. So that's how the hydrogen ions get sucked up with this and the hydroxyls get sucked up with that to limit the change in pH. <laughs> I'm looking for blank stairs or spinning heads. Okay. Think about it for a while. <laughs> Over Thanksgiving. <clears throat> we'll do a review on the Friday we come back. And I've given you um, the review document and worked problems. Right? So if you if you try and through the review document and you get stuck. And you can look at the worked problems and see how I worked that problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the handwritten ones. Yeah. I try to use good penmanship. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, that explains what I, those two slides are what I was just talking about here. So I'm not going to stop there. Okay, now suppose we want to calculate the pH of a buffer solution. Well, um, you can do it using um, a method called um, uh, I forget the name of it now. <clears throat> uh, almost came to me. Ice. ICE equilibrium calculations. I stands for initial uh, I change equilibrium. Right. Uh, we don't have time to do that. But what you can use is this uh, calculation, this uh, equation that was developed by um, Henderson and modified by Hasselbach. That's why it has both names hyphenated. And it allows you to calculate the pH of uh, your buffer if you know concentrations at equilibrium. And you know the pK for the acid that you're using. So the weak acid will have a pK. We take the, uh, the Ka for that acid and take the uh, negative log of it. That's the pK. And you can look these up in reference manuals. They're just pages and pages of them. But we start off with this equation, right? The dissociation equation, the ionization equation for our weak acid. And we write the expression for that acid, okay? The equilibrium expression has uh, hydrogen ions and conjugate base in the numerator, and then the weak acid in the denominator. Right? We've done that already. We want to know the pH of that solution. 
when it's at equilibrium. So we solve the equation for the hydrogen ions, right? Because we're going to have to do a transformation and figure out um, by transforming that hydrogen into a pH. Actually, we're going to do the entire equation. Just do the negative log of the whole thing, right? Is that permitted mathematically speaking? Yeah, that's a rhetorical question. So there it is. Take the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration is equal to the negative log of the Ka and the negative log of what's left over, the acid concentration divided by the, its conjugate base concentration. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to leave that ratio alone on the far right. Just leave it as the negative log for now. And call the others what they are, the pH and the pK, okay? But we also want to get rid of that negative value in front of the log. So do you remember if you say um, uh, the log of A over B, if the negative log is that, then the positive log is B over A. Correct? Remember, think back to math class. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do to this one. We're going to change that negative sign to a positive, but that means we have to flip the ratio in here. That's the henderson hasselbalch equation. So what you need to know in order to do the calculation is actually three things. You need to know the pK of the acid, the weak acid, that value. And then you need to know what's the concentration of the conjugate base and what's the concentration concentration of the uh, un unionized acid. If you know those three values, you can calculate the pH. All right. So let's say we have we're making a buffer solution and we're making it out of 0.45 molar acetic acid. So that's the concentration of the, uh, the acid. And we're also adding 0.85 molar sodium acetate. Right? So the sodium is just, is just there as a balancing ion. What we're interested in is that acetate ion. So the acetate ion is in the concentration of 0.85 molar. Right? Because there's only one sodium and there's one acetate. So if the molarity of the compound is 0.85, the molarity of the ions is also 0.85 each. And the Ka of acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So we're not given the pK for, for acetic acid. We have to calculate it. All right, so there's the, the equation for the dissociation of the weak acid. And there's the expression, pH equals negative log of the Ka. So we just put it in there as negative log of the Ka because that's what pKa means. And we have a Ka, but we don't have a pKa yet. And then the log of the concentration of the, the uh, conjugate base over the acid concentration. And if we plug those numbers in, we find that our solution should be at 5.02 pH. And that's where it's buffered. Okay, that's Henderson Hasselbach. Uh, let's see. Run it out of time. All right. So you think you could derive the henderson hasselbach equation? Go back and look at that slide again, step by step. All right, what's an electrolyte? Well, electrolyte is one of those operationally defined. An electrolyte is anything dissolved in water that will conduct electricity in solution. 
because it produces ions. Remember, you gotta have ions, you gotta have mobile ions in order to complete the circuit. Uh, if you had a sodium chloride crystal this big and you put electrodes here and you have a battery and a light, the light will not burn because the ions are stuck. They're in a solid crystal. They won't move. Put them in solution, there's your electrolyte. Okay, non-electrolytes don't light the bulb, like sugar water. Sugar does not ionize in water, so it will not conduct electricity. It dissolves in water, yeah, but it's not an electrolyte. Strong electrolytes, they completely dissociate. Strong acids, strong bases, and all soluble salts. They're strong electrolytes. They will conduct electricity through that solution, and the bulb will light, big and bright. Weak electrolytes, the bulb will light a little bit, but not much because there are fewer ions in there to, to transmit the charge. And remember, pure water is an insulator, right? You put, uh, say, a 12 volt battery, and you put an electrode here and an electrode here, uh, water will not conduct that electricity. It will not complete the circuit. Now, if you get a high enough voltage, like a lightning strike, uh, it's enough energy there to ionize the water and then it'll conduct. That's why they don't stand in water when you're uh, right in a lightning storm. Or if you're out playing golf and it starts raining real heavy and there are puddles everywhere, don't stand in a puddle. <clears throat> All right, so there's a definition of an electrolyte. Um, this is a useful unit of measure called the equivalent. The equivalent of any ion, it refers to its molar concentration, but it's actually the molar amount of that ion that's needed to supply one mole of positive or one mole of negative charge. So you could have an equivalent of a negative ion or an equivalent of a positive ion, either way. Um, and it has to do with the charge. So that's why that middle one with the chloride only has a single charge. So one mole of chloride is one equivalent of chloride. Now, why are we going to all this trouble? Because the reactions that we're interested in, where you have negatives and positives, acids and bases, salts, um, they're molar relationships with the charges. So if you have, um, say uh, one equivalent of sodium and one equivalent of sulfate, the sulfate has twice as many negative charges as the sodium has positive charges, right? So that's not stoichiometric. You need two equivalents of sodium for every one equivalent of sulfate for those to be equal in charge. So the one mole of sulfate is two equivalents and one mole of phosphate is three equivalents because of its charge. Another expression, the milli equivalent. The milli equivalent is just a thousandth of an equivalent. That's what milli means, right? One thousandth of. All right. <clears throat> so. Where do you see electrolytes on your uh, blood work, <laughs> your lab test? It'll, it'll give you the values in milli equivalents per liter. Um, and that's standard. That's just the way it is. Sodium is the major, sodium and chloride are major uh, electrolytes in your blood. Uh, and then the other's lesser. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because this is not a physiology class. So, the concentration of calcium 2 plus ion present in the sample is 5.3 milli equivalents per liter. How many milligrams of calcium ion are present in 180 milliliters of sample? This is a dimensional analysis problem, right? Unit conversions. We know we want 180 milliliters, so 
if we're going to be talking in terms of milli equivalents per liter, we got to change those to liters first, right? That's what those first two steps are for, right? We change 180 milliliters to liters, uh, and we also introduce milli equivalents. So uh, now we know how many milli equivalents of calcium we have. How many equivalents is that? And then what's the ratio of moles of calcium to equivalents? Right. So uh, you can see, let's see, do I have that animated? Yeah. So there we're canceling units as we go. Right. Now we're down to equivalents. One mole of calcium two plus is two equivalents. Right. So now we have moles of calcium. We can convert moles of calcium to grams of calcium, right? And then we convert it to milligrams. And we know that with those conditions, we have 19 milligrams of calcium two plus ions in that sample. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Neutralization reaction. This is the lab that we're gonna skip, unfortunately. Determination of molecular weight of an acid. We would have done a titration with that acid. And all you're doing is you're balancing the equivalence of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions in solution. This is an acid-based titration. So the key is that you have, uh, for instance, you have a known, well, let's back up. How do we express the concentrations? typically as molarity, right? Remember the definition of molarity? It's moles per liter, moles per unit volume, okay? So if we wanna know the number of moles of anything, we take the volume times the molarity and that equals moles. Well, if this is a, a monoprotic acid, that would be the molarity of the hydrogen ions times the volume in liters equals moles of hydrogen ions. Okay. Now, if we titrate a, an acid with a base, what we want is the equivalent number of hydroxides and hydroxyls to produce water. Okay. So the titration says, if I know what this one is, and I add base gradually until I reach neutrality, then I know that I've added exactly the same number of hydroxyls as hydrogens. That's a titration. And we use that to determine um, how many moles of an acid there are in a, in a sample if we know exactly how many hydroxyls we've added, or vice versa, we could say we add uh, an acid to a known number of moles of base, and we get the same results, but we answer a different question. So the titration depends on that reaction. Hydrogen ions, hydroxyls, you water. That's what that, that thing right there means. Where's my arrow? Right there. That's the basis for uh, acid-base titration. And in order to do the stoichiometry, you just need to know the moles of that, the moles of that. Right. And if you know the moles of this, then you can say that's equal to the moles of that. They are equivalent. And in order to do that, we need to know, we need to deliver a known amount. In other words, when we start delivering, um, say, a base that's in that device, that device right there is called a burette, right there. And it's marked off in a scale with the big lines are milliliters and the little lines are tenths of milliliters. So you can know as you add it gradually, Right, and you have an indicator in the solution that tells you when you've reached the end point. 
then you read the volume off of there and put the volume in this expression or the volume in this expression, whichever. And if you know this one and you know that one, you can calculate the molarity of the unknown solution. All right. That's that's the quick and dirty explanation. Come on, there we go. Now, there's a, a fine distinction between equivalence point and endpoint. The equivalence point is the stoichiometric e equality of these two. That's when they are equivalent. You can determine that with a pH meter, but you have to draw a curve and find it on the curve where it is. But if you have to do 100 or 200 or 300 samples with that same titration over and over and over again, uh, that's going to take more than a day. So if you have to do them all in a day, we use an acid base indicator, something that you put in there, and we're going to use phenol phthalein for our work today in about one minute. <laughs> and it changes color when you reach, when you're very close to the equivalence point. Right, and that's it's wise to choose that indicator so that it changes color where you want it to. And that way you can do them quick, one after the other. So the endpoint is as close to the equivalence point as you can get it for your indicator. Um, I'm not going to stop there. All right, I don't want to eat up all your time. I'm going to leave these on the screen, read them and answer the questions. And there should be some uh, problems to work in your review document that address this problem. And then if you still have trouble, go to the work problems and that'll explain it. If you still have trouble, uh, send me an email. I mean, I'll Zoom with you over the break if you need. Between bites. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's just one. Of the, all these flies in our ointment. You got another fly in the ointment here. Suppose your acid delivers two or three or more protons for every mole of the acid. Then you have a different stoichiometry there. And it helps to write out the whole balanced equation to do that. That's what we would have had to do with the uh, that last titration, the determination of molecular weight of an acid because we were going to titrate against an acid that has three protons with a base that only has one hydroxyl. So then you have to use the stoichiometry for the reaction. And it's probably, I mean, if you want to take a look at it, the method is in Brightspace, if you're interested, with a pretty good explanation of what's going on in the reaction. Okay. If the base and the acid are both monoprotic, you can use this expression. Molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid equals the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. This is moles, that's moles. They have to be equivalent, right? If it's not monoprotic, then you have to substitute here a term called normality, which takes into account those multiple ions. Right. And we don't have time to go through it right now. I apologize. But if they're both monoprotic, monobasic, that works fine. So if you were titrating sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, then or acetic acid, which only has one proton, then that works great. <clears throat> 